A warm welcome to this talk and a welcome back to friend of the channel, Dr. Claire Craig. Claire, thank you so much for coming back. Thanks for having me back, John. And in the past, we have uh, unpicked your excellent text in two, in two, uh, two, two, two long interviews, actually. So uh, we'll put the links to those if people want to, to catch up. Now, the reason people should watch this video, as far as I understand this, uh, Claire, is that there's some really powerful data come out of uh, the Czech Republic because participant level data has been has been released uh, or low level data has been released. Um, what's your take on why people should listen for the next few minutes? So, yeah, the Czech Republic have, Czechia is what they're called now, have released the whole database on um, on a patient by patient level. So they've anonymized it by just giving the year of birth, but they've given the date of vaccination and if somebody died, their date of death and what product they had. And so this is over 10 million people. So, you know, there's a massive data set. And what we haven't had before is information by vaccine type. And it is incredibly telling what you can pick, learn from that. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a sample. This isn't a research study. This is this is data from the entire population of Chechia. That's it. And and this is the data that we've been asking our governments in the United Kingdom, the United States to release for years now. Uh, but we still haven't got access to as far as I understand it. That's right. So we're being told in the UK that we can't have record level data because um, the latest comment that I've had on this back from the Information Commissioner's Office, who have agreed with the UK Health Security Agency that releasing such data would cause mental and physical illness in the relatives of people who had died, which is an extraordinary claim. And they also um, make out that it would be used to um, increase vaccine hesitancy. You think, well, if that's what they really believe, if they believe that that data would increase vaccine hesitancy, then they should release it. Absolutely incredible. And uh, viewers will have their own views on uh, maybe, maybe even more reasons why the data hasn't been released. Who knows? We'll see what they say in the comments. Now, this is the first graph we'd like to look at, Claire, from the analysis of this data. Now, th this data did come from freedom of information requests, and we have to credit Steve Kirsch here, don't we? I think he's been uh, involved throughout this process and he's been uh, quite tenacious in, in his uh, obtaining this data and analysis of this data. Um, so I think the person who requested it was actually uh, someone in the Czech, in Czechia. Um, and it's been on the internet for four months, but Steve has absolutely spent hours and hours on this, analysing it very thoroughly and, and, you know, coming at it from every different angle. And, and actually, I've joined in, you know, I've spent hours and hours on this too. So, you know, I'm confident about this data. Good to hear. What's this first graphic we're looking at here, Claire, please? Right. So this graph has got um, people's age along the x-axis. So they're young on the left and they're old on the right. Mm -hmm. And then what we've plotted is a ratio. So if, if I sort of start at the beginning, most people got Pfizer and a minority got Moderna. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is see how many people died a year after their first dose or a year after their second dose. And from that, you can take the deaths out of the population who had had that dose and get a mortality rate. So we've taken the Moderna mortality rate and the Pfizer mortality rate and compared them. So where the data is above one, that means that there was a higher mortality rate in Moderna than Pfizer. And where it's below one, it would be more a higher mortality rate in Pfizer. But what you can see is that for all of these age groups across that long period of time from March to December, it was consistently a higher mortality rate in Moderna. And, and what you can also see is that it's not the same higher mortality rate. So the younger have the highest and the older people have much closer to one. But of course, this is what you expect if you've got something that causes a problem in one and however many doses. Because if you've got a population of 20 year olds who aren't dying much and one and however many doses then die, then you're going to see a massive impact on their overall mortality rate because the background numbers are low. But if you're looking at 90 year olds or 100 year olds, there are so many background deaths that a few excess because of however many per dose isn't going to impact so much on their overall number. So you expect to see that 
difference that we see going through the age groups. That's entirely expected. But what we're seeing there is between the ages of what? About uh, 40, 46 and 68. We're looking at around about 50% more deaths in, in Moderna as opposed to Pfizer. That's a, a huge increase, isn't it? It is a huge increase, but it's not the same as 50% increase in baseline mortality because these vaccinated groups are not typical. It's not a typical sample of the population, right? So what you see is that the people who've got a high risk of dying in the next year anyway rejected the drugs because they said, well, you know, I'm at the end of my life. I'm not interested in all of this stuff. And so that, the consequence of that is that the unvaccinated have a really high mortality rate and the vaccinated have a really low mortality rate. So in this data set, vaccinated people in that first year had a mortality rate that's over the course of that year is sort of between 40 and 60 percent of baseline expectations. So these are really, really healthy groups. So their deaths are low. And so having new deaths on top of that, you can easily get to bigger percentages, even if you don't see a huge excess across the whole population. Is the plausible mechanism why Moderna should have more deaths than Pfizer? Yeah. <laughs> um, so just Moderna has a high dose, right? So right from the outset, Moderna had 100 micrograms of the mRNA in the same type of lipid nanoparticle as Pfizer. And otherwise, they were essentially the same product. There's, there's nothing really to tell between them. Um, in fact, uh, Pfizer was being sued by Moderna for um, patent breaches because it's essentially the same product. So in, if you look at the preclinical data from the Pfizer trial, they rejected the higher doses because of their toxicity. And Moderna used the higher doses. So, so, you know, there, there is absolutely evidence to think that Moderna would be more of a problem. And then you can look at what's happened um, when, when people reanalyzed all the trial data in the paper by Joseph Freeman, um, along with Peter Doshi, they found that the extra adverse events, so, you know, they took away the background placebo rate and the extra serious adverse events of special interest worked out at 10 per 10,000 for Pfizer and 15 for 10,000 for Moderna. So you've got another data point there. And then if you look at any of the vaccine adverse event report systems across the world, they've all seen more reports from Moderna than Pfizer. So you know, there's a lot of kind of other indicators that point to Moderna having been more of a problem. We are seeing a fairly consistent pattern here, aren't we? Now, given that there was 10 million people in this study, OK, not that many had Moderna, but uh, could these results have arisen by chance? In other words, is there a good significance uh, to, to these results, do you think? Right, that's a really important question. And, um, and that's the question that's been put to us since publishing this, because people, want to, you know, people who are arguing that the vaccines are safe, they want to find an excuse like that. But it's pretty hard to do it. So what you have to sort of... One argument you could say would be, well, what if Moderna was given to people who were more sick, okay? So let's just toy with that idea. If you, if you had a system whereby anybody who was thought to be more likely to die, and it wasn't, they weren't the people who were rejecting the vaccine, so they weren't the ones that were definitely going to die, mm. they're just a bit more likely to die, and they're going to get prioritised to have Moderna. So what you'd expect to see then would be proportionately more Moderna doses being given to older age groups than younger age groups because you know that you're much more likely to be able to predict illness in older people than in people in their 20s and we don't see that so between the ages of um, 25 and um, 69 it's pretty um, the ratio of, of how much Pfizer and how much Moderna was given was just pretty much steady so there is there isn't that age difference it's essentially a random it's, it's essentially the essentially random samples then really aren't there it's that there's no um, in those age groups, yes. In, in the older age groups, it's a little bit messier because they only had Pfizer in January. Then there was this great kind of rush of Moderna. They have disproportionately more Moderna in, in the seven year olds. So we, we did a lot of the analysis on the younger age groups because it was messier in the older ones. But having done the analysis in the younger age groups, kind of, you know, the older ones aren't outliers, in fact. Mm -hmm. Why did uh, you and Steve choose to analyse this data by comparing uh, Pfizer or cause mortality to Moderna or cause mortality as opposed com to comparing the Pfizer and the Moderna with the unvaccinated? 
Right. So we've done that analysis. On, I mean, we've had data to do that analysis for some time. And so um, and this data set doesn't seem to be very different to other ones on that count. But because of the problem of people being healthier when they're vaccinated and remaining healthier for some time, um, the unvaccinated will have a ridiculously high mortality rate because you've got more dying people and a much, much smaller baseline population. So the unvaccinated are bound to have a high mortality rate. And um, on the last graph that we were going to look at, it might be worth just skipping to that. Mm. The, um, you can see the high mortality rate in the unvaccinated, but there's a few sort of extra things to look at around that. Here it is. So this, what they've done here is they've taken the mortality rate for different groups at different times and said, well, for each of the different age groups, we know how many were dying per 100,000. And we can apply that to this sort of standard population where you have 1,000 over 90-year-olds and 2,000 80 to 85, 89 year olds and that kind of thing. So that you've got 100,000 people that are distributed in a standardised way. And then you can compare them and so the age confounding is gone in this graph. Um, but what you see with the unvaccinated is when everybody's unvaccinated in 2020, you've got this sort of baseline, which I put a big green line across to sort mm. of make, represent that. And then you've got um, uh, um, COVID at, at the end of 2020, um, which is killing everybody before the vaccines arrive. And, um, and then the, the unvaccinated in the summer of 2021, there's dying. And then the, if you look at the sort of summer lows, it's coming down. So this mm. ability to predict all of these dying people reduces over time. And if you look at the blue line, which is Pfizer, you can see that that summer baseline is going up. So, you know, the, the, the two are sort of getting towards each other, but they haven't yet met because, you know, we're not yet at a point where they're equally unhealthy, equally likely to die. Now, there's a lot more people in the Pfizer group than in the unvaccinated group. And that's why the Pfizer group is closer to baseline than the unvaccinated. Um, but when you look at all these other products, which are all the other coloured lines, Moderna is the red line, you can see that um, they're higher than Pfizer the whole way through. And that by summer 2022, they're dying more than the baseline in 2020. Now, that's a, that's a problem. That is a definite problem. So, that, so one of the arguments is that this has nothing to do with safety. It's a difference in efficacy. So, mm. yeah, sure, more people were dying with Moderna, but that's because it doesn't work as well as Pfizer. So that's the argument. Now, of course, if that were true, you'd see a change in this ratio over time. And when you had a lot of COVID around, you'd see the discrepancy. And when there wasn't COVID around, they'd come back together. Um, but this is in a high COVID period, you can see exactly the same ratios. And then in Chechia, they really didn't have much COVID at all for July to October, which is the next graph. And, and it looks the same again. Um, and you can look at, I mean, there, there's a, a few moments where it's dipping below one in that period. But, you know, I, I think because these are in populations where there's a lot of background death, I'm not, I don't, I'm not concerned about that. Um, because you just, you know, you'd lose these small numbers in the noise. Mm. And, and of course, we, we, we know that the, the Pfizer vaccine itself is associated with um, significant uh, adverse reactions. So the fact that the Moderna is causing more or cause mortality is more than something we're worried about already. That's right. And, and what I'm working on at the moment and haven't finished is trying to figure out if we can tell that from this data. So, so what we can tell, you know, we've got this, this, this sort of, this is how much worse it was number. And we've, but we've also got, um, what you can do is you can say, well, if, of these people with Moderna, how many would have died if they'd had Pfizer? So you can take the Pfizer mortality rate and work out how many would have died. And then you can have a sort of excess deaths. And from that excess deaths, you can say, well, how many extra people died per dose of Moderna that was given? And what you find, unsurprisingly, is that that's a bigger number for young people and a smaller number for old people. And so from that, you can kind of make it, you, know, you start to sort of have to extrapolate a bit, but you can make a model saying, well, this is how many dose, um, deaths per dose we anticipate extra. And then from that, you can try out different ratios of Pfizer to Moderna because you've got your sort of extra bit. And so let's say it was, let's say it was 
three Moderna deaths to every Pfizer, then you can just take the extra, divide it by two, and that gives you the Pfizer. And then you take the Pfizer and divide, times it by three, and that gives you the total Moderna problem. So I'm doing that and just working on different numbers because you can then test those out and say, well, how many excess deaths would that mean? And obviously there are numbers you could put in at which point you get more deaths than there were, you know, so you're like, well, it can't be that. Mm. Um, and then you can also um, compare it with um, the, these ratios. So you say, well, what impact does that have on the overall ratio? And if it's not what we see, then it can't be that either. So you can then start to get boundaries on what that ratio might be for the, you know, for the actual excess, mm. not just the all-cause excess. Mm. But of course, all, all this, uh, th th these clever manipulations wouldn't be necessary in the UK, for example, if our government just released adequate amounts of data, which is the frustrating, uh, the frustrating thing here, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and the, uh, well, of course, the, the, you, what you have to conclude is that, you know, the reason we used to have lots of really, really good data transparency in this country and don't anymore is because they don't want you to see it. I mean, you have to conclude that, don't you? There's no way. Well, yeah, a cynic, a cynic would conclude, might conclude that indeed. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it really is strange. But uh, I can't say I'm particularly reassured to know the government knows it. I'm not sure. Um, I, I prefer I prefer a peer review process, but. This is this is what we've got, unfortunately. Yeah, but well, we're going to work on a peer review paper for this. Mm. You know, it, one day somebody might accept it. <laughs> I very much doubt it, but uh, I'll, we'll certainly look forward to seeing it. <laughs> well, it won't get in a mainstream journal, I wouldn't have thought, but it, it can certainly get published as a peer reviewed publication, which is uh, you know the, the gold standard that we like to use on this channel, for example. So we could spend a lot of time um, arguing whether the vaccines were beneficial in, in the early part of the pandemic. But now that COVID is so much less uh, of a significant uh, illness, um, what, what, what has that done to the, uh, the risk benefit analysis of the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines? So, you know, I think from the, from the very outset, there was never an argument to give it to young people in terms of risk benefit. And that argument wasn't even made. You know, they, were, they were arguing it was in terms of saving other people, weren't they? It's meant to be an altruistic one, which is not a sound way to do medicine at all. Um, but as soon as the data started coming in, there were questions very early on. There were countries who were pulling vaccines from the oldest because they were dying from it. And they said, this has got to be assessed more carefully in the frail. And then very soon after, they were pulling them in the youngest. Um, in the, you know, the AstraZeneca brain clot story. And, um, and you know, the, I, I think if you look at the big picture, it's really hard to get, it's really easy to get a distorted impression in the UK because the UK was a bit of an outlier in the Delta wave. We weren't the only outlier. So Ireland and Portugal and the UK, all of us had a, a very steep um, winter first COVID wave. And this kind of, if you look at the, our trajectory compared with Europe as a whole, it's like a witch's hat on the top in terms of how much COVID death there was. And then in the Delta wave, there was a lot less. But if you look at Europe as a whole, the Delta wave is pretty much the same size as the previous ones. And in America, you can look at the Delta death wave and it's the same size as the previous ones. And you can also look at hospitalizations because they collate over the whole of the USA. And it's the same magnitude as the previous ones. And so you're like, well, well the, this, is, this is a period at which we can assess vaccine efficacy because thereafter there was Omicron and before then there was no vaccine. And so if this Delta wave is essentially the same type of wave as the previous two major waves, then there was no efficacy. Broadly, there was no efficacy. And so, you know, I said on that graph, there might have been a tiny bit. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it all becomes academic in terms of the, the bigger picture story here. You don't, you don't go and vaccinate billions of people when the efficacy story did not hold water. And, and it, it didn't hold water from the beginning. And these vaccines were authorised for stopping infections, which they never did. And when it was shown that they were not doing that, the authorisations became invalid. And yet they carried on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
What are the implications of this? So from for, for memory, we've got a uh, respiratory syncytial virus vaccine now approved in the, uh, the United States and in Europe, um, also based on uh, RNA technology. There's research going on into a influenza RNA vaccine and, and many other RNA vaccines are under development with a new plant in the UK in Harwell Science Park in Oxford to produce 250 million Moderna vaccine doses a day, similar in Canada, similar in Australia. The whole world seems to be going flat out on this um, Moderna endeavour. Do you think that the increased all-cause mortality identified from the Chechia data has got implications for caution going forward? Absolutely. So um, the, a lot of people have tried to put all of the problems with the vaccine on the fact that it was producing spike protein all over the body. And, you know, I think that was a problem, right? Because and I think a lot of the pathology does have a sort of COVID-like appearance and physicians were mistaking it for COVID, but, you know, test negative COVID when people were first being vaccinated. And, you know, the vaccinated are producing spike years later. So there's definitely a, a spike pathology element of it. But the lipid nanoparticles were known to be toxic and, and the companies using them had failed to get any cancer drugs approved even because the toxicity was too high. Mm. Um, and they, you know, they cross membrane, cell membranes and that, they go that, all across that's the body. Even, even if you inject empty lipid nanoparticles. Well, they were, you know, they were using it for, for therapies. Um, when, but when but, but it's the lipid problem. nanoparticles are intrinsically uh, have a yeah, level to be of honest, toxicity. I don't think that trial's ever been done where they've done empty ones, which mm. is ridiculous. Mm. That's like a really important trial to do, <laughs> empty ones. Mm. Um, but actually, it's, it's not just the lipid nanoparticle. It's the principle of having a lipid nanoparticle that delivers an instruction to make a foreign protein into your cells. Because if that protein is a membrane-bound protein, yeah. then that cell is then it's got a death sentence on it and mm. your immune system will come and kill it. And if that's happening in organs across your body, then that is going to cause all sorts of harm. So and, when, and when, when you say a membrane bound protein, this is the RNA goes into the cell because it's systemically distributed. This could be in the heart. It could be in the kidneys. It could, could be anywhere. It produces this foreign protein, which sits on the surface of the cell. And normally when that happens, it's because a cell is virally infected. So we have T cytotoxic cells come and just take out the whole cell. So yeah. we'll be getting healthy cells taken out all over the place by this uh, immunological uh, destruction of, of previously healthy cells. Yes, and, and even if you had a design where, which you could do, where it wasn't in the cell, it was, it was secreted from the cell, mm. you'd still got a huge inflammatory response to that. Mm. And, and that comes with consequences. And then even if it's just a question of, of, you know, something that was more benign, educating your immune system, if, you've, if you're changing how your immune system is, is seeing the world, that can have consequences in terms of autoimmune disease. So every single one of those factors is important to consider. And, you know, the, Moderna had another trial for, um, for an mRNA product, and they saw myocarditis again, for example. And so, you know, if you've got a different foreign protein being expressed in the heart, then there's your myocarditis problem all over again and you know it, it would it just seems so ridiculous that having that the story we've been told is well this has been given to billions and they were all fine so now it's safe You're like well no it was given to billions and it was very not fine it was really really not fine yeah. and and it's not and you know they, they've thrown a load of money at this that's the trouble isn't it that they've invested in this so massively and the british they, government they have uh, got a deal with moderna to produce vaccines for the next mm -hmm or genetic products for the next 10 years, as far as I'm aware. Huge numbers of vaccines, mm. you know, more than we could ever possibly use. I don't know mm. where it's going, really. Really, it's quite strange. So um, we might come on to this in a minute, but basically, uh, I think we're calling for a monitorium on mRNA technology until we know what the heck is going on here. Yes, and to, just, that's a nice segue to talk about the HOPE Accord. Just it briefly. is indeed, which I yes. happen to have in front of me. OK. <laughs> So the Hope Accord, I know you've already talked to your yeah. about it. But should, should we just go through, the, go through the, the main sections, Claire, if you don't mind?